Uh, I've been talking about how getting ready for this is making changes in what I'm writing. So we had a big, big Damascus Road experience this last week. <laughs> um, the, uh, what I've said, you know, this is my autobiography. And, you know, he's, I said major changes occurred in the world when man first spoke, when man first wrote, when man first printed. That's right around the Reformation. And now we've digitized the word. In my career at Timken, the digital age, they say, started around 1970. Now, it, it started earlier than that. The, actually, a German invented the transistor like in 1922. But it was the um, Bell Labs was the one that the guy that invented never was able to make one that worked. But Bell Labs made a transistor that worked. And then that started when the space program came. Um, there was a lot of uh, emphasis put on implementing the digital technology, re replacing the radio tubes and all that kind of stuff. And my career at Temkin was kind of coincidence with, with the digital age coming of age. When I started working in research at Temkin, we were still using the old manual calculators that you tapped. And by one year there, HP came out with a digital calculator that was like that big. And we got a lot of tools at uh, the research center that allowed us to analyze how bearings worked. And that's the whole story there. Now, what I've been preaching for a long time is that I think the digital age, the improved communications that's coming about has the chance that we could finally figure out how to live with each other and not fight anymore and not have wars. So I'm, I'm saying the improved communications that comes about by our increased mobility, which is a result of Timken bearings and the wheel and all that, and the uh, ability to instantly communicate has the potential to end wars. So as I write the book, I'm going through, um, you know, Luther in the Reformation got into a big discussion on free will and freedom with a guy by the name of Erasmus. And, and, uh, they had this big debate about his free will that was created by what Luther argued in his 95 Thesis uh, was we were saved by God's grace and not by works. We, wanted, we end up doing works, but not for salvation. We do it because it, it makes us feel good. So the whole idea of Christianity if you, you know, you're, it's talking about your salvation, but it's not only talking about salvation in after you die, but the salvation that you're presently living with, living the world you're living in. And so they were both right, um, because up until Luther's time, the church ran the government in one way or other. But after Luther said that, that's what led to, to uh, American democracy. And we went down that road more effectively than they did in Europe. In Europe, uh, the, the church, like in Germany, the, the church still runs the government, or the government still runs the church in Europe. Uh, where in our country, we don't, we don't do it. And then this, this I, I said last week that um, the, the uh, Christianity is different because it puts the emphasis on helping others where in, in the rest of the world, um, 
like in Asia, the the religion there, Buddhism, ends, it has an emphasis on improving yourself, not helping others. The same thing applies in the Middle East. They're, they're still having the, what's known as a theocracy where the government is actually the church. So you have in, in uh, the world we're living in today, you have a, a theocracy in the Middle East, you have a oligarchy in China and Russia, which is run by not religious people, but run by a few. And you have democracy in the United States running the world the way we see it should be run. And that's helping others rather than emphasis on yourself. So uh, I, I had that revelation this week. So you'll see now that I'm talking about the Middle East, creating the Middle East. And then we're going to talk about creating Western, the Western world, which is based more on Christianity, where the Eastern world, even though the Muslims say they, they are, believe Christ was important in their religion, they're still running the government uh, as a theocracy rather than a democracy. So that's the history. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about what I presently have on the Middle East. I'm going to make some changes as we go along. Can, can people hear me? Yeah. I'm, my, my voice is kind of rough this morning. Okay, so with that introduction, let's look at creating the Middle East. Okay, Carl, help. I'm looking to move the slide up. I, I thought I just had to tap that. But. Slide shows up here. I'm trying to think of what the button will show up on the screen, but I forget where that is because DJ doesn't know where my mine is not around anywhere. down here. That'll advance, I think. Yeah. There you go. 
the beginning of one minute. Be slow, my friend. There you go. Okay. Okay. So it was around 2300 BC, a guy by the name of Sargon the Great, uh, who lived between like 2334 to 2279 BC, conquered and consolidated these city states that were forming into what became known as the Northern Kingdom of Mesopotamia to form the Assyrian Empire. And so now, you know, cities became kind of states, and then they became uh, kingdoms, and then they became nations, so and empires. So we're creating empires now. In the southern Mesopotamia, modern-day eastern Turkey, uh, southern uh, or northern Syria, and southern Iraq and, or and uh, Elam, which is western Iran, to create the earliest... So the, the earliest empires were created in the Middle East. And you can see in the map here where, where they were forming. That's kind of a map of kind of a, I gotta find a better one, but that's kind of what the world looks today in that part of the world. Uh, so we come from there to there. Now, that part of the world, like I said earlier, is ruled today by a theocracy. So the church runs the governments there mostly, except, of course, in Israel. Now, around 2000 BC, the ancient Sumerian civilization of Mesopotamia split and gave way to the Babylonian Empire in southern Mesopotamia and the Assyrian Empire in the northern Mesopotamia, all of biblical fame. And this is all in the Bible about the, the Babylonian Empire and the, the Assyrian Empire. The Babylonian Empire would be created by consolidation of a number of city-states, southern Mesopotamia, modern-day Turkey, northern Syria, and around the Baghdad to the Persian Gulf. The Assyrian Empire was created in northern Mesopotamia, modern-day Lebanon, Syria, Israel, and Jordan. Now, the rulers that ruled these empires determined the culture and society that developed from these particular empires in a particular epoch. Some were bene benevolent and and just while others were despotic. How the ruler advanced the state of intellect, technical culture, and material development in human society was key to his success. Progress in the arts and the development of know-how, the extensive use of record keeping, including written, were the foundation of a complex political and social institution that evolved the economy, the government, and religious beliefs. Now, these institutions determined the ruling king's success as a leader and the civilization being created and his ability to capture the hearts and the minds of his subjects. Confucius was a kind of a philosopher like um, Socrates and Aristotle and, and Plato. Of course, those Plato influenced um, the, the Christian religion. Confucius was actually a, was lived in China, and he's the one that put the emphasis on improving self, where Western culture put the emphasis on the, what the church was, Christianity was preaching, and that's to live for the sake of helping others. Um, but Confucius said sometime later in time, tell us the successful leadership or administrator requires a minimization of effort, not heavy-handedness. So the good ruler stayed in the background, exemplifying the virtues and inspiring his subjects, not threatening them. 
in the study of the history, it appears a benevolent and just ruler was more successful in getting a greater percentage of his or her subjects to create, to be creative and come up with new methods to govern and new know how to implement. And if you look at, if you're coming out of the, out of the Reformation into the Enlightenment and the Industrial Age, um, you, you see a lot of emphasis being placed on man's ability to be free is what gives him, makes him into an entrepreneur where he wants to create something for others to help them. Now, one of the best known rulers of the Babylonian Empire was a guy by the name of Hammurabi, who became the ruler of the Southern Mesopotamian Empire, created by King Kin, that should be King Sargon, in the early 1700s. Hammurabi, Hammurabi is best known for the Code of Hammurabi, a legal text which contains over 300 articles on stone tablets given to him by the great Babylonian god Marduk. So it's kind of like Moses, or yeah, Moses getting the Ten Commandments. He had over 300 articles, and Marduk was the patron god of Babylonia. He was kind of the, the head god of many gods. The Babylonian king of the gods was, was Marduk, who presided over justice, compassion, healing, regeneration, magic, and fairness well known for its har his harshness, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Murders were put to death as a sacrifice to the gods and people who stole had their hands cut off. So that was a little bit more punishing than what we get. The recovery of about 2,000 burial attests to the practice of human sacrifice on a large scale in ancient Mesopotamia. And they, here's some more of the evidence. Uh, at or even before the demise of kings and queens, members of the court, handmaidens, warriors, and others were put to death. Their bodies were usually arranged neatly, the women in elaborate headdresses, the warriors with weapons at their side. Could somebody get me a drink? And these death pits uh, were found in an ancient city like Ur, contained remains of 68 women and six men more, many of whom appear to have been sacrificed, dating back about 4,600 years. Archaeologists believe that the pits are, were used to bury Ur rulers. Thanks, Carl. Their function in death was to serve their masters as they had in the real, real world. Their function in death was to serve their masters. That needs to be corrected. Okay, so now we're in Ur. That's where Abram is. And also this code also clarified the responsibility of judges to establish standards for commercial transactions and contracts, spell out the rules and rights of the children women and the slaves. It even specified that the government themselves are under the law. Thus there were limits on the power of rule. Now, as metal tools evolved, monumental architecture was in Mesopotamia first appeared as temples and later in pyramid shaped structures known as ziggurats. Temples and ziggurats were dwelling places for the gods who were part of the Sumerian city state had great periods of of political strength and prosperity, but just as quickly could tumble into obscurity. The root of the Christian faith begins with Genesis 12, as the Bible shifts its focus from the history of the entire human race, just as we are doing to a man named Abram, the first Hebrew who was living in Ur. Ur is not always a pleasant place to live, as we just noticed because they gave sacrifices to appease the gods. It was at this time and place that gods decided to change the way was in order 
for humankind and called Abram to follow one God rather than many gods, which was the practice at the time, and to gain his trust, asked him to offer his son Isaac to be a sacrifice. But we all know the end, the rest of the story. Isaac was saved, and so were Abram and the followers, God's chosen people. God willed that no sacrifices were required for their salvation, and all they had was expected of them was to have faith in one God whom they called Yahweh. So that's the beginning of kind of Christianity. Now, God's covenant promise to Abram was if he would follow him, leave Ur in southern Mesopotamia and journey to the land that he had never seen, the land of Canaan and northern Mesopotamia. So they kind of separated northern and southern earlier, the Babylonian Empire and the and the uh, Assyrian Empire. And now the Southern Empire is deciding to go into the Northern Empire. You think that's going to cause problems? You bet. And we're still fighting the war. God would make the descendants a great nation and through his seed, the Savior of the world would come. God changed his name to Abram and means father of many nations and his journey to the land of Canaan begins. The distance from Ur to Canaan is 3,500 miles. Abram's journey through time takes him up to Ur north along the Euphrates River and then heads south to ancient city of Damascus, capital of present-day Syria, and then further south to the land of Cana. As well described in the Old Testament of the Bible, there were many trying times in this journey. Now, once they reached Cana, Jacob's grandson of Abram was the son of Isaac and Rebeth, and is considered the traditional ancestors of the Hebrew people. So here we have the beginning of, of creating Israel. Through the, the 12 sons by various women and formed the new Israelite nation named in honor of of uh, uh, Mar Marduk. Uh, Jacob was known to display favoritism among his children, particularly for Joseph and Benjamin, the son of his favorite wife, Rachel, and so the tribe themselves were not treated equally in the divine sense. So now you have the formation of, of Israel. The tribe of Levi had no land appropriation, but had six cities of refuge under their administration, as well as the Temple of Jerusalem. There was no land allocation for the tribe of Joseph, but Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Menshech, received their father's land proportion. I suspect it was because Joseph probably had died. Thus, the tribes receiving an allotment were Reuben, Simon, Ephraim, Judah, Issachar, Seblin, Dan, Naphtila, Gad, Asher, Man Manish, Sheps, and Benjamin. So, and they all got different proportions of land, I guess, depending upon how Jacob liked, the, liked what they were doing. So Jacob and, and Joseph arrived in Egypt as it was making the transition from the old kingdom to the new kingdom and becoming an empire. Uh, you know, they, they created Israel, but then they, they ran into a drought. And so they headed south to Egypt where they could grow crops and feed themselves. And they arrived there, like I said, when the new kingdom was becoming an empire around 1800 BC. So the new kingdom was an empire, was considered the golden age of civilization in ancient Egypt. The Nile River was the highway that joined the countries together. Until 1900 BC, travel by land and trade goods was virtually unknown. Sailboats were the main means of transporting people and goods around the country. On the Nile prevailing winds, and this, this is kind of interesting, I think. Um, on the Nile, the prevailing winds blow south, 
propelling boats traveling in that direction while boats heading north rely on the current, giving them a real advantage to bring together the upper and lower and the old and the new kingdom. It's like perpetual motion. The wind takes you one direction, the current takes you the other direction. So they had a transportation system developing that was very effective to making uh, Egypt a very powerful, powerful nation. About the same time the Israelites arrived, history tells us, Egypt began to invade the people uh, of Asian origin. And these were known as the, in the Bible they were referred to as Hittites. In the, uh, in the secular world, they're known as Hesachs, or shepherd kings. They came for the same reason as the Israelites, as famine had struck in the homeland as well. And figure four is the picture I just showed. Hicksot, Hittites in the Bible Empire and the Hebrews homeland were th of the same part of the Mediterranean. But unlike the Israelites, they came in a warring way. The Hittites were the first people to use chariots in warfare. And um, that gave them a, a real advantage when they fought the Egyptians because they came not in peace like the like the Israelites to Egypt, they came in uh, with, with their tanks, so to speak. And the reason they were really successful in winning their position in, in Egypt was because of the chariots. The spoke wheel for chariots as a weapon of war were first used by the Hicksas, Hittites, and we talked about that. And that was around 1500 BC. Now, the Hicksites originally lived in what is today modern day Turkey and northern Syria. Many scholars believe the ancestors of the Hicksites who originally lived in Central Asia before relocating to Anatolia, modern Turkey, in the third millennium BC. And what you're seeing here is is why people moved around. And you know, if you go way back, when we talked on that chart there, back to Noah's day, uh, they, after the flood, God said, you know, populate the world. And so the, the uh, uh, people, when they needed more food or more land to grow food, they didn't fight with each other they just moved to a place where nobody was and took over. And that's how they ended up coming over to North America and down to settle in southern Mexico and, and, and southern South America. That was the migration that was caused. But the Hicksas, Hicksas came uh, fighting as fighters. Now, the Hicksas melted easily into Egyptian society. At first, eventually, they became very powerful. And finally, in a coup, they came to rule the whole of northern Egypt, imposing one of, the, of their people as the legitimate pharaoh. During the Hicksas' rule of Upper Egypt, they established their capital in the city of Avaris in Lower Egypt. They were able to accomplish this because they took advantage of the time when the dynasty of Pharaoh came to an end because the Pharaoh had no sons to succeed him. This was usually the sign of the end of the dynasty and the beginning of another. Also, Joseph's wisdom was impressed that the new Hicksas Pharaohs to the point that they were appointed viceroy of Egypt, which was second in power only to the Pharaoh. So uh, the viceroy, the the Hyksos is what brought the, the Israelites to a powerful place in, in, in uh, uh, Egypt, being kind of next in line to the Pharaoh. So now the Hyksos brought the Egyptian Middle Kingdom to an end 
and ruled the land of the Nile Delta from 1700 B.C. to 1514 B.C. In 1514 B.C., Amenhotep, with the help of his mother Nefertiti, uh, the rebel queen of Thebes, Irene Cordon, this is her quote in her book, after more than a century of turmoil, expelled the Hyksos. So now they pushed the Hyksos out. And now the new kingdom that was created was led by some of Egypt's greatest pharaohs, Queen Hesusub, King Thutmose III, and Amenhotep III. Now, it's interesting with the queens. You know, these guys creating their empire, they were fighting all the time. And they were, so the, so the king or whatever, the pharaoh was out fighting battles. And guess who was running the country? The queen back home. So women, don't say you didn't rule the world. So. Uh, but anyway, uh, also, uh, Nefertiti was the mother of Tutankhamun. And Tutankhamun is where they found all the, in that tomb, they found all the, the relics of Egypt that are really impressive. And uh, so you start seeing the connection. And I think it was, I got to get this straight, but um, Agnaton was the one that tried to form a monotheistic religion in Egypt. But after, after uh, he tried that, he lasted through his term. And I think the, the, uh, all the, the uh, people in the temples, all the religious guys, we're looking at losing their jobs, so they decided we don't want this guy. We'll lose our jobs if we keep sticking with him. Now, I think we saw that, yeah. So that brings us to the end of this segment. And uh, I think we'll stop here, but next time we'll continue from this point. As, as so, so we're beginning to create the Middle East, and now we're going to start focusing on moving and creating Western civilization, which, like I said earlier, is, is based in Christianity, where the Middle East is, is not, and really the, the message of Christianity, giving, sharing, loving, caring, is not in in uh, Middle East religion, and likewise we'll find that it's not in the Asian religion with Buddhism. So we'll stop here. Are there any questions? Yeah, yeah. Well, you'll find out that next week what, what, what happened is um, the, the pharaohs, the Egyptian people, started to see that the, the Jewish people were becoming very powerful. And, you know, next in, next in line. So what happened, I think, is they... They actually, they they say they didn't make them slaves, but they they uh, imp kind of imprisoned them and made them build roads and stuff like that. And actually, there's very little implications that they were actually slaves building the pyramids, like a lot of movies suggest. Um, but that was what kind of worried them. And like I say, the same thing when Ignatan proposed that they have uh, one God rather than you know what they had heard from a guy like Marduk. Um, 
I think the the guys running the temples, the religious guys, said we're going to lose our job if this guy keeps. Yeah, yeah. So it 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 sort of starts making sense, and and you know they, you know when I used to read the the Bible the, about the Hittites, I never figured out. I said how. How could these people come in? Because Egypt was pretty powerful, but they had the chariots, and they had tanks, and the and the uh, the Egyptians didn't have that, so they took over. So, so it kind of ties things together for me. So, other questions? Okay, thank you.